if our next speaker is one of the most anticipated speakers every year, and I believe she's spoken three times at Diana Initiative now, and every year it's always packed. So you are, you have found the right place to be. Um, Tanya Jenka, also known as She Hacks Purple, is the author of Alice and Bob Learn Application Security. She's also the founder of We Hack Purple, an online learning community and a podcast that <laughs> teaches people how to make create secure software. <laughs> Tanya's been coding for 20 years. She's won a ton of awards. She's worked at tech giants like Microsoft and Adobe and Nokia. She's been a pen tester. She's been a startup founder, a CISO, and a software developer. She's an award-winning public speaker, an active blogger and streamer, and she's done hundreds of talks and trainings on six different continents. So we got we to gotta get her to Antarctica at some point, I guess. So she values diversity and inclusion and kindness, which shines through. Now, today... Tanya's going to be talking about a topic that, in my humble opinion, she knows probably more about than anyone on the entire planet. That is DevSecOps. Tanya, educate us. Oh, my gosh, Ray. That is like the best introduction I have ever had. And honestly, I was supposed to go to Antarctica this year and then COVID. <laughs> Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Tanya. Thank you so much for coming. I know that there are a whole bunch of other completely awesome talks at this time, so I appreciate you choosing mine. I'm going to talk about DevSecOps and how it's more than just pipelines. It's not just pipelines. So if you're thinking in your head, what is a pipeline? Don't worry. I'm going to explain all of this. I'm going to explain what DevOps is, what DevSecOps is, what application security is, but especially about how we don't have to shove 100 security tools into a pipeline in order to ensure that the applications being made in a DevOps environment are secure. There's a whole bunch of different strategies, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Awesome. Okay, I like to tell you what I'm going to tell you, then I tell you, and then at the end, I'll tell you what I told you. And I do this because I really, really want you to take some of these lessons away with you back to your office and then have you creating more secure software. So please forgive me as I do a little intro for you. So what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about the fact that DevOps is not just about pipeline software. It's not it's not just CI CD. There's so much more to it than that. I know that you know DevOps pipeline, release pipeline, CI CD pipeline, we hear these buzzwords all the time, but DevOps is actually a cultural change and complete restructuring of the way that you make software. So there's no more silos. And it's not just about using automation software, although Obviously, automation is awesome. We're also going to talk about what the heck DevSecOps is and how basically, well, spoiler alert, DevSecOps is just application security plus DevOps. And I'm going to explain all of that too. And then we're going to show a whole bunch of AppSec program goals. So an application security program and what the goals are that you could be trying to achieve that work with DevOps and that you don't need a pipeline for. Wah! So I'm going to give you, I think it's uh, 12 different overarching goals and then a whole bunch of different ways that we can do them without a pipeline. Yes. Okay, so um, this is the About Me slide. We have the About Me slide. This is why I didn't used to do them and then I was told that I had to do them. This is the, I'm trying to convince you I'm qualified to give this talk. I feel like Ray did a way better job than I ever could. Ray's the best. He has a podcast and you should listen to it. I do. Okay, enough about me. I'm, uh, enough about Ray. I'm supposed to talk about me. So I founded my own company, We Hack Purple, and we do training. And I'm biased, but I think it's awesome. And apparently our customers do too. Um, I'm known as SheX Purple. I Yes, I love purple. I'm a purple teamer. So that's blue team, defense, plus red team, attacker. I couldn't make up my mind, so ended up joining the purple team. Um, I just wrote my first book and it just went for sale last week and it's called Alice and Bob Learn Application Security and I'm over, like just bubbling over with excitement about it. Um, I've worked in tech forever. Um, I'm one of the founders of WOSAC and um, I am one of the founders of an OWASP project and an OWASP chapter. I'm really excited about community um, and I blog and stream and podcast and I am a nerd at large on the internet. I feel like that's, I'm a nerd on the internet. It's like the best way to describe me, but anyway. Okay, so that's lots. And I hope you're like, she seems qualified. I'm willing to sit through this. All right. Okay, so what is DevOps? 
Okay, so this is a contested question. So there are so many people all over the planet and they often have different opinions. And unfortunately, what a lot of people will say is, oh yeah, we have you know, this automated release pipeline and therefore we're doing DevOps. But DevOps is a cultural change with the way that you make software. It's about breaking down the silos between dev and ops and security so that we all work together as one big team that is trying to release kick-ass software. And kick-ass software is secure, just to be clear. And so DevOps has three ways, according to the DevOps handbook, the Phoenix Project, Accelerate, et cetera, et cetera. There's a whole bunch of books written by a whole bunch of people that basically invented DevOps. And we are going to go through what the three ways are. So I'm going to tell them to you again in a little bit, but for now, DevOps culturally and technically is about creating processes that respect the three ways. The first way is that we need to make sure that we are emphasizing the speed of the entire system. So not just Tanya's part, but I need to make sure the whole system is working really, really well. And sometimes that means getting up from my desk and walking over to another person's desk and helping them. Or sometimes if I'm suffering, there's all these things happening, it means me asking for help from another team. The second way of DevOps is really, really, really fast feedback. And if you've seen any of my other talks, I almost always talk about shifting or pushing left. And so I want to give security feedback all the time, not just at the end. And then the third way of DevOps is continuous improvement and continuous learning. So taking time aside to improve your daily work on a regular basis. And we're gonna talk about all of this from a security perspective, this whole talk. Yeah. Okay, so what is CICD? So again, this is a lot. So CICD stands for continuous integration, continuous delivery and continuous deployment. So continuous integration is the idea that we should push all of our code together on a regular basis to make sure that my code doesn't break, doesn't break Alice's code or Bob's code, right? If all three of us are separately coding all day for weeks at a time, and then we, we mash it all together, that's called integration for when you know, the program's supposed to work together, and it's gonna be awful. But if every single day we have this automated thing that puts it all together and make sure that it works with a whole bunch of glorious tests, then we know it will work. So continuous integration means constantly checking your code back in to the main part so that everything works together and you make sure that you haven't broken everything. And if you have, you fix it and then try again. So then there's continuous delivery. So I feel that this is using pipeline software. Uh, the idea that you are constantly de delivering changes to your customers and your clients, and this can be security fixes. Hi -ya! Um, and so the continuous delivery aspect is the idea of using automation, the idea of constantly giving them updates and changes as opposed to with waterfall where we would, we would wait a whole year sometimes in order to release the product. And meanwhile, the clients got nothing. And then the last one here is continuous deployment. So I know you're thinking it's not CI, CD, CD, but just go with me. The D has more than one meaning. So continuous deployment is where you have this automated integration happening all the time. You're checking in changes, you're releasing it out into the world so your customers can enjoy it, but that you have so many tests and you have such confidence in your system that you allow it to deploy without manual intervention. And that is a slightly more advanced activity. You do not need to have continuous deployment, so no manual intervention before release in order for you to have, be a part of DevOps and be doing DevOps properly. It's just a more advanced, more confident type of activity that you wanna wait till you're ready for so that when it's happening, you're like, yeah, that's awesome, as opposed to it keeping you up at night and stressing you out. That's not the right reason to do CD as in continuous deployment. Okay, so why are we all excited about DevOps? Why, why does everyone want a pipeline? And so the pipeline is the software that does the releasing. Um, so why? Okay, so the first, the first thing is, is trunk-based development. So, Alice, Bob, and I, we're all coding all sorts of stuff. We're excited. If we wait weeks and weeks to put it together, then 
the integration will be hard because it will have changed and worked slightly because that is the nature of all of you working separately. However, if we are doing trunk based development and by that I mean checking it back into the main branch over and over again and making sure all the time that it works, there's way less risk. It's way less painful if I've only added five lines of code to make sure that it works properly versus if I've been working on it a whole month. I could code a lot of code in one month. <laughs> and so it's really, it's really important um, that you check it in regularly and that means less risk. And I don't know about you, but as a security person, I feel less risk is excellent. So the next reason people love CI CD and why everyone wants to have a pipeline is because it means speed and accuracy. So when you do automation, it means it's a perfectly repeatable process every time. When I do things manually, so let's say I'm gonna peel an orange, every time I peel the orange, it's gonna be completely different because I am a human and I make miniature tiny errors all the time. But if you have a machine that peels oranges, it will do it the exact same way every time as the beauty of automation. And so once you've made sure it's working right, it'll work right every time and it can go way faster than a human being. Imagine trying to manually check all the different checks and manually rerun every test every time. That sounds boring. That sounds like the type of work that people will give to students because they don't want students to learn or something. <laughs> I don't want anyone doing that work except my computer processor. So speed and accuracy. And the last reason that I will go to on this page, because there are more reasons, um, is integration means less errors. And by that, I mean, there's less errors at the end. It means that we can test all sorts of parts of the integration. So we're integrating, but then on top of that, I can add security tests. I can add resiliency testing. Like, pressure uh, or stress testing and performance testing, just like crunch my app into little pieces. But the point of this is that there's a lot of benefits and that's why people are doing it. I know that sometimes with buzzwords, for instance, like blockchain, a lot of people are like, let's, let's put blockchain on everything. And blockchain doesn't actually make every single thing better, but I am hard pressed to find situations where CI CD doesn't make everything better. So what is AppSec? Application security is any and every single thing that you do to make sure that your software is secure. And by that, I mean, it could be you doing a, a manual code review of code to look for security problems. It could be you using a SaaS tool, so a static application security testing tool to look for a security problem. It could be a software developer coming in and saying, oh, I got this email um, from the framework that we use. And it said that there's this big problem with you know, this specific version and that it, it's telling everyone we need to upgrade it because there's a security problem. I think we should upgrade it. That's AppSec. It doesn't need to be extremely formal, but if you are trying to ensure your software is secure, you are officially fighting the good fight. And so, oh, and guess who said this? I said this. I like quotes in my talks, um, but sometimes, no one else said the thing I wanted, so I have to say it. Um, so what is DevSecOps? Uh, so my friend Imran Mohammed taught me this. So, you know, I, I was just getting a handle on application security and I'm like, well, what is DevSecOps? And he said, Tanya, it's, it's what we've always done. It's just us doing AppSec, but in a DevOps environment. We have to change so that we fit into their processes you know, we don't want to break and smash all their stuff, but we still have all the same goals, all the same things that we always wanted. It's just, you know, they're doing DevOps, so we got to do it too. And I'm like, gosh, you make it sound so easy. <laughs> okay, so now I'm going to go over the three ways of DevOps again, because when we know them, then we understand why I'm talking about each part throughout the talk of which things fit into which way. So the first way is emphasizing the efficiency of the entire system. That means not just your part. It means giving really fast feedback that is accurate and getting it to the correct people as soon as possible. There is no point in doing a pen test and then giving the results to the developers one year later. I have seen many reports that just go nowhere or get sent to a manager and then it stays in their inbox for three weeks before they notice it and then they send it to the dev team. No, that's not what we want. 
And the last one, the third way is continuous learning. It's taking time to improve your daily work. It's experimentation and calculated risk taking so that you can just continue to do better and better and better. Okay, so now we're experts in DevOps, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so then you're thinking, what about pipelines, Tanya? I thought DevOps, I just had to buy Circle CI or Jenkins and I was all set. Oh, that person lied to you. I mean, don't get me wrong. I want to have Circle CI and Jenkins. I want to have Azure DevOps. I want to have GitHub Actions. I want everything. Um, but that doesn't mean I'm doing DevOps. Okay, so pipelines are part of the first way. So let's back up, actually. We'll back up just a sec. So pipelines are part of emphasizing the efficiency and the speed of the entire system. So automating things with a pipeline definitely helps with efficiency and speed. Awesome. Fast feedback. So if you break the build, boom, that's the fastest feedback you could ever get. Um, and then continuous learning. If you are going to continue to use a pipeline, part of your continuous learning will likely be to improve the speed and efficiency and the tooling that you've decided to put into the pipeline. And that will be part of continuous learning. It will be you doing proof of concepts and experimentation to try to speed up your pipeline or to get better, more accurate results. So. Now let's go on to the rest of the talk. So this is the main meat of the talk. This is the main focus. And basically, I'm going to tell you 12 application security program goals. So when we create a program, so that is the formalization of the things that we want to do to make sure our software is secure. So we, it's a rule every single time that we are going to do design, we're going to do threat modeling of the design to find out what threats it faces. And then we are going to plan out mitigations for those threats or test for those threats or code review for those threats. Okay. So that could be a, a thing, an activity that we do that's part of our program. So I want to talk about goals. So the goals are high level strategies, things that we, that we want to achieve. And then the activities and the tools and the tactics are all the things we do to achieve our goals, right? So I'm going to talk about the goals and then all sorts of strategies and tactics that we can do that fit into a DevOps environment, but that we don't have to crowd the pipeline with. All right, let's go. Okay, so, oh yeah, I, I was experimenting with adding cute animations. I don't know. You can give me feedback after if this, the twirling of the goals is good or not. Okay, so the first goal, so the first goal that I want to tell you about is inventory. So if you work somewhere and you think you have 20 apps, but you really have 25 apps, those five extra apps that you don't know about, that you are not caring for, supporting, maintaining, taking care of, they are probably not going through a pipeline at all. They probably aren't getting security testing. They're probably not following your policies. And inventory is a really, really difficult problem in our industry. It is, um, it's a thing I've written many articles about and I've seen a, a few talks about it. I honestly, I'd love to see more. I'd love to hear from more companies about how they do this because quite often I, I just see that they're, they're not. And then there's a whole bunch of apps they're unaware of and guess which ones cause security incidents. Hmm. <laughs> Um, so you can't protect something if you don't know you have it. So this is very bad. Um, and so now they're adding, so there's a bunch of new tools coming out. So there's internet domain scraping. I'm not sure exactly what else to call it to describe it, but basically you give them your URL and the companies will go and basically do amazing open source intelligence gathering like I've never seen before that's automated and they will find all of your public facing IP addresses, URLs, every single page and say, hey, did you know you had this? So that's one way to do inventory. That's super helpful. Um, you can put agents on your network, on your servers that track your assets. That is another way. Um, there are some tools on the market for that now and they have some pretty darn good accuracy. Uh, I like to end map all the things. So just do like a big giant scan. Um, and then I like to ping things that have port 80 or port 443 open because that means it's a web server 
And then there's probably a web app there or an API or a web service or something sitting there and I want to know about it. Um, if you use cloud, you want to check all your platforms as a service and your infrastructures as a service that have port 443 or 80 open. And then you also want to check your cloud dashboard because there's probably a whole bunch of things in there. For instance, serverless. Serverless is kind of hard to scan for because it keeps disappearing on you. But in your dashboard, you should be able to see it in your list of resources. And so you want to include this in your inventory. But the key thing to take away from here is that if you don't know about it, that it's not going to be in a pipeline, right? If something's in a pipeline, you clearly know about it. You have inventoried it. Good job. Um, but you can't run it through all of its paces like you want to and you need to to secure it if you're not aware of it. So these are some ways that you could do some inventory and none of them require a pipeline. Um, so the next one is finding bugs. <laughs> I know you're like, of course you wanna find bugs. I mean security bugs. But specifically the program goal that I'm talking about is finding security bugs in written code, in running code, and third party code. So I want every AppSec program to have this capability and so Written code is, you know, if, then, else. It's your actual static code that you can read with your eyes. It's not running and you can analyze, like you can do manual code review, you can do tools on it, etc. Then there's running code. So that's when your application is in a dynamic state. It's running on a web server or a PaaS or whatever. And then you're testing it by interacting with it. Um, and then third party code is libraries and components and frameworks, et cetera, that you didn't write. So it's code you didn't write, but you still have to accept the risk for. And I wanna find bugs in that too. And so I feel that every AppSec program should have this goal and they should have one or more strategies or tactics involved in finding one of those, each one of those three. So the old way that some of us used to do is we would use manual, manual code review. You can still do manual code review. Um, we would do static application security testing, so a SaaS product outside a pipeline. We could run a DAST tool, a dynamic application security testing tool, um, and we could run it ourselves manually. Um, we could do a manual review of third-party components. That sounds awful. Um, that's a lot and a lot of work. Uh, there are really amazing companies that do software composition analysis that do that for a living. And I prefer to uh, subscribe to one of those, those tools so that they can check for me because there's only so many hours in a day. Um, and then you can hire a pen tester at the very end. So this is more like the standards that I've seen a lot of times. But in a DevOps environment, you might want to do things slightly new ways. So you could do testing in real time. Um, so a newer type of security testing tool would be IAST, Interactive Application Security Testing. And it's a binary that you plug right into your app. And then it runs as you do quality assurance, as you have a pen test done, as all of your automated tests are running and you do user acceptance testing, all of that, the IAST is just, it's doing interactive um, testing as in uh, dynamic testing and static testing at the same time on just the parts that are being used. And those are the parts that count, right? And so then it just keeps finding bugs and reporting it to you. So that is a newer way that we can do things and you don't need a pipeline. Um, I am a big fan of scanning third-party components and you can scan it in a pipeline, but you could also scan it upon check-in, right? You could just have it scanned any changes in that on check-in and it scans then. You could also have it check, like just scan your repo once a day or once a week and give you a report and stick that stuff into the backlog for you. You don't have to put this check in the pipeline to get really, really, really good results. Um, the last one I'm gonna mention is, so there's a whole bunch of things that you can do in regards to finding bugs, um, like a, a bug bounty, a coordinated disclosure program, et cetera, but a really good one is you can actually like set up automated dynamic application security testing scans that just are scheduled and just keep happening. And I think a lot of people, they tend to run things manually, but if you are spending a whole bunch of time setting up something to run manually once, why not spend 10 extra minutes and automate it and schedule it every month? I just, 
that's the way I like to do things. Uh, you know, if I forget someone's birthday, I put it in my calendar for every year for the rest of my life so that then I don't forget it again, right? Mm, okay. Uh, so the next one is knowledge and knowledge is power, right? And so I want you to have the knowledge to fix the bugs that you find. Because if you find a whole bunch of bugs and then your team doesn't have the knowledge to fix them, then that's problematic. And I know you're probably thinking, um, you know, no one can memorize everything, but you can really support your developers in having a lot more knowledge that you need them to have. So knowledge is the third way of DevOps, right? So through and through, just continuing to learn, having knowledge is the third way of DevOps. It's, it's so important <laughs> um, to making sure that you're actually doing DevOps as opposed to you have bought a really awesome copy of Circle CI and you have, are releasing one of your 20 apps with it. It's just, it's not the same. And so a thing I like to do with my knowledge is uh, so I am a big fan of data and metrics, et cetera. So what I quite often do with clients is I will get vulnerability management tools. So I'll take all their scan results from way before I worked there and then I mash it all together in Excel, or if they have a vulnerability management tool, I mean, then I do a happy dance because that's very rare. Um, and then I mash it all together and then I try to attack things in a strategic way. So if I know they're having tons of cross-site scripting and then they're not having any injection problems, then I want to give them knowledge specifically on cross-site scripting as opposed to concentrating on injection. A lot of companies I see, they educate on the entire OWASP top 10 and try to make their developers memorize all of it. However, if you're only having a problem with two of the 10, I don't know, I think you might get your best bang for your buck, just like concentrating on those two and bringing that level down. I'm also a big fan, if you wanna have, if you wanna spread knowledge quickly of starting a security champions program, that's where you try to have people self-identify as being interested in security, and then you give them all the knowledge and you support them because then they are your advocate when they go out into their own teams and they're answering questions and helping people and bringing up potential issues, et cetera. And you don't need a pipeline for any of these things. And they're all very DevOps friendly. They go very, very well along with the third way and weave themselves through all the processes and you, don't need a pipeline in order to give them knowledge on how to fix the bugs that they find. So another item that I am big on is education, but specifically developer education. So we can give them knowledge on specific things, right? So there's a specific problem with X, great. Um, but what if I wanna educate them overall so that they understand my secure coding guideline? You know, let's say we have a standard on secure coding I want them to know the whole thing because they're being held accountable to that standard or if there's security policies, et cetera. So let's look at some ways we could educate our developers. We could provide educational and reference materials for developers about security. And by this, I mean, we could buy books, we could buy a subscription service uh, to videos or to blog articles, research papers, et cetera. We can, well, basically just provide them whatever works best for them. I find that if you try to dictate to them, like let's say you just keep buying physical textbooks, some people prefer e-readers or audiobooks, etc. I find it's best to ask them what format they like things in and try to adopt or adjust what you are gonna get to what they like to consume the best. Um, I'm a huge fan of advocacy programs. When I worked at Microsoft, I was an advocate. And basically every security job I've had, I've been the security advocate and I try to spread the news about security and I try to positively affect culture change. And the idea is it's this person that's always there to help you. Um, you can start a security champions program. Yes, I'm a huge fan of security champions. Um, there's this blog called Hella Secure and they have a really good blog article about security champions and about kind of how to develop them. I'm gonna write one soon because I, I liked theirs so much, but I feel there's there's even more we could add. I feel like 
um, security champions are a really good way to spend your security time. Lunch and learns. So you might be thinking, oh, Tanya presents professionally and she's a professional trainer, so she's really good at that. I was awful at presenting when I started. It was very bad. My first presentation, I was so nervous. I actually thought the audience could hear my heart beating across the room. I was like, my chest might explode and I may just very die. But I didn't, it was fine. It turned out it's totally fine and I survived. And each time it got easier and easier. And then I spoke at a meetup, which was also quite scary, but I survived again. And this means you can too. And giving a lunch and learn to different teams in your office, like the pressure is not really on. You just need to tell them the thing that's really important to you. And I promise you it gets less scary each time. And then eventually you'll just be like, it'll be like secondhand. And you just go up there and you just try to express the thing that's important to you as opposed to worrying about if you're getting it perfect or not. Because no one's perfect and it's okay. Um, the last thing on this I'm going to put, so that I've had really, really good success with this. So reserving a block of time in your calendar every week that is supposed to be for self-paced learning. So I completed three university courses in nine months doing this. I asked my boss permission to do this and they said, yeah, sure. Like, I don't care, two hours a week. And not every, I didn't do it every week. So sometimes my week would just be super wild. There's too much happening. I'm overwhelmed and I would skip it. But then the next week, Thursday would come and it would say, it's, you know, in 15 minutes, it's four o'clock, Tanya, and you're supposed to do self-study. And I think, oh yes, yeah, so I'm going to wrap up what I'm doing. And then I'm going to start my self-study. This worked really well for me. Bosses really like it because as opposed to taking a course for, you know, four straight days and you miss four straight days of work, two hours a week doesn't seem that intense and you can still get most of your work done and then they can actually see real progress in your studies. It worked for me, it might work for you. Okay, so the next uh, goal that I like to have or strategy specifically for when I'm doing, um, for when I'm trying to do some DevSecOps is I like to give developers security tools. So I'm a big fan of giving them a DAS, a dynamic application security testing tool. I like to show them about negative unit tests so they can make take their positive unit tests, make a copy, and then add harm, problematic payloads, which act like an attack, and then we test to see if their application works properly. This is an awesome thing that developers can do. They can write their own security tests with your support. Um, I like to you know, set up scanning of the repository for them and sending them the results so they can action them. I am a huge fan of supporting them. If they, so their IDE is the thing that they program in all day. So you can add tools that just like plug in and help them with all sorts of cool stuff. And then they can see it right in the place that they spend all of their time all day. I like to support all of this. If there is a tool that they are interested in having, I try really, really hard to get it for them because this is the best type of pushing left. Like if they can fix the code as they're writing the code, this is awesome. Um, and if it if they're willing to do it, if they're on board, I am so happy to encourage this behavior. Give them a safe place to do testing, teach them how to use these tools safely and effectively, and then just let them go because developers are amazing and they're obviously super technical and like they'll I have found that they can add some pretty cool stuff when I'm not looking and impress the socks off me. Okay, so a secure SDLC. Um, so a goal that I like to have for every AppSec program I develop is one or more security activities during every phase of the system development life cycle. So the SDLC is whether you're doing DevOps, Agile or whatever, you need to have requirements you need to do design, you do the super fun coding part, you do the super fun testing part, and then you deploy and release and maintain. And each one of those phases should have at least one security thing in it, in my opinion, in order to have a secure system development lifecycle. And so what could some of those be? Um, so you can have a set of standard security requirements for all new software projects. So for instance, standard requirements for web apps standard requirements for APIs and web services, standard requirements for serverless. So then every time they start a new project, they have this head start on everything because they already know what they need to build in. 
You could have a secure coding guideline so they understand how to code at the level that you desire them to code at. And if you can add code samples and snippets or have a secure code library, so within the code repository, have an area where they share good samples, samples of known good code, awesome. Um, another thing is uh, reviewing, reviewing and respecting secure design principles when in the design phase. So applying least privilege, applying assumed breach, applying all of these principles that help to ensure that your stuff is secure, like least privilege means that, or zero trust, right? Like all of these things are design decisions and you need to do them during design, not after you've released it because that will be painful. And so spending time to review that or Threat modeling, I'm a big fan of threat modeling. It's basically evil brainstorming. And this again, should be done during the design. But if you need to do it in a later phase, you still can, it still is helpful, but design is the best choice. Other ones, assigning an AppSec person to, as a resource to a project team, and that person answers all their security questions the whole way through the project. This is called the partnership model. This is a great way to make sure that they are on track. Um, another thing is, you know, when you hire a penetration tester or someone to do a security assessment of your systems, that person operates outside of a, a pipeline. Chaos engineering, red team exercises, again, that does not need a pipeline. Monitoring, alerting, logging, I want you to do all of those and none of them require pipeline software. Incident response, unless the incident is happening to your pipeline, the pipeline should not be involved in your incident response process. Um, so the last one I'm going to give you here on secure SDLC, it is my favorite topic, so sorry. <laughs> um, I, like, I, could, I could and have done tons of talks where it's the whole thing is just me loving secure SDLC. Um, but security sprints. So if you're doing agile or DevOps where you do your work in sprints. So let's say, you know, three weeks to develop and test and release this feature. Another three weeks for the next feature. Well, how about a security sprint? And during that security sprint, you do a huge code review and then have the bugs fixed, or they go back and fix every single security bug that's in the backlog, or you have a penetration test done and they fix the results. There are so many ways that if you ask for time in the schedule, you can make sure your security activities get done. Okay, so tools that operate outside a pipeline and still help you secure your apps and don't break everything in a DevOps system. So a big goal that I set with all my clients is that we wanna have effective and useful tooling. I don't care how much it costs. I need the results to be accurate. I need the results to be timely and it can't miss lots of important stuff. That's what I need. And if it's in a pipeline, great. If it's not in a pipeline, great. I, so we want accuracy, we want valuable feedback. So telling me that in a third party library that there's a zero day and there's no known fix for it and you don't have a workaround for me and I'm just screwed, that scares me and it doesn't help me make my app more secure. So that's not value, oh, that's not valuable feedback. And I want good coverage. I, I don't want a tool that, you know, all of its results are 100% accurate, but it misses 95% of the things that are wrong with your app. That is not helpful. So tools that could go outside the pipeline, right? So if you put a tool in a pipeline that has a bunch of false positives and then a false broken build, you'll make people cranky. Um, if you add a tool and it runs like 10 hours and you try putting that in a pipeline, your tool is gonna be turned off. It will, trust me. Um, I feel that continuous scanning could be more accurate. So there are some tools where you can just continuously scan all the time and then when everyone's away on the weekend, it's still doing its thing. So you can have DNS-based scanning, agent-based scanning, code repo scans, et cetera. Um, but the last thing I'm going to get to on this slide, oh no, my battery's almost dead. Oh, sorry. I might have to do a quick switch. We'll see how it goes. I feel like we can do this though. <laughs> um, the last thing I wanna to talk to you about on this is, so 
most people, when they think of a pipeline, they think of the release pipeline, the pipeline that actually eventually releases the code to prod. But pipeline software will let you make as many as you want to, and they don't need to go anywhere. So you can make a second pipeline that kicks off that runs super slow, long tests, and it automates the calling of those results. It automates taking those results and putting them into your vulnerability management software. But at the same time, you know, the real release pipeline runs and your asynchronous pipeline, it goes off into nowhere and it's just getting you a bunch of results that you can look into on Monday and you can dig through, remove all the false positives and then send the real much smaller subset of results to the developers to fix and put it in their backlog. This is another way um, where you are not in the release pipeline, but you can still use the pipeline software to get good, fast results. Incident response. Um, so I dream of working at places where the incident response team understands AppSec. So when you are an AppSec professional, if you work at a place and the incident response team does not understand the security of software, whenever there is an incident that revolves around security, tap your it and suddenly you're part of the incident response team and all the work that you have planned that week goes out the window. I have I have had jobs before where three out of every four weeks, all I'm doing is responding to incidents. And I'm like, you need someone on the incident team that actually knows this stuff because I have two jobs and you pay me for one and I don't like it and all my projects are behind and I feel stressed. I really like to complete my projects on time. Um, and so it's like, you know, we need two people. But anyway, so having a trained incident response team does not require a pipeline. But to make sure they are ready for security, we want to make sure that we create a process, we share it widely, we want to give them access to our inventory document and information so they know which apps we have and where they are and who to talk to about them. We want to make sure they have access to the code repository so that they can scan our code for problems. They might need access to some of our tools. We need to participate in postmortems, even if it's uncomfortable. Um, and we need to make sure that there's some sort of training once a year so that we all know what we're supposed to do because I don't want to find out during an incident. Um, a bonus to this goal for your program is implementing tools to prevent or detect application security incidents in the first place. That is something that I didn't have time for in this talk, but I'm so excited about trying to prevent incidents from happening. This is like a thing I really like. Okay. So the last thing that I am going to mention as an AppSec program goal is metrics. Do you see how happy that lady and her kid are? Do you want to know why, what they're looking at on that screen? They're so happy. It's metrics. It's data. <laughs> I love data and I love using it so that I can be more awesome. I want my AppSec program to be out of this world. I want it. I want it go beyond every single person's expectations. I want to make my organization's software so difficult to hack that malicious actors give up and go bother someone else. That's what I want. Um, I want to be able to defend against all but the absolutely most advanced attackers. And metrics can help you do this. So I'm a huge fan. So remember we talked about continuous learning? Metrics can help with this. So continuously improve our programs based on metrics and experimentation. Also ask for feedback, ask for feedback from the devs, ask for feedback from ops, ask for feedback from other security people like the network team. Talk to your customers, talk to anyone you can to get feedback that could be helpful for you and making your program better. Um, I, I also, every three months, I go and I look through all my postmortems, I look through my security incident reports, I look through all like any sort of trends in my tools and what the data is telling me because I want to see improvements in places I've been working on. I also experiment to try to find better ways to reach my goals and I measure it so I know if it's working or not so I can double down on the good stuff and abandon the stuff that's not working. I also proof of concept new tools um, because I they're expensive and I don't want to buy the wrong one. Even if it's my client's money, it's still, if my recommendation is bad, that's not cool. So I want a proof of concept everything, and that is experimentation. Again, part of the third way. 
If you can visit other application security shops to learn from them, you should. I used to work for the Canadian government and I could actually talk to all the other shops. I could talk to other incident responders and it really, really helped me. If you have this opportunity, you should totally see if you can do it. Um, follow industry leaders in this area to learn more. So if there, so there's like a bunch of people that I follow where they just keep releasing awesome stuff. Find people that speak your language and follow them and learn from them. A lot of them give away a ton of great stuff for free. Um, and attend conferences and sit in on talks like this one. Form relationships with other areas of IT to see if you can find ways to work together and you can improve the entire system for them. Right? So if you can improve the way security works throughout the entire system, that's a huge win. And that's you doing DevOps. And that's you not needing a pipeline, but still working within the confines of DevOps and still getting your security job done. And that's awesome. Whew. OK, so summary, summary time. So we went over 12 different ways that 12 different AppSec program goals and how to reach them in a DevOps environment without cramming 25 tools into a pipeline. I have worked with clients that have 9, 10, 11 tools in a pipeline and all their developers are basically on, not pleased, not pleased. There are ways that we can still do an awesome job at ensuring the software that they build is secure without putting everything, like I wanna put stuff in there, don't get me wrong, I wanna put stuff in there, I just don't need to put everything in there. Um, and so then we talked about how AppSec is not just one tool or one tactic. There's a whole bunch of ways to reach our goals. Not, no one way is perfect for everyone. So you need to do the one that is best for your organization and gets you the best results. And that DevOps is not just pipelines. There are the whole three ways. It is a culture. It is about creating processes that work. It is about constantly working to improve and improve and improve so everything gets better. And the software you create is rugged and it's high quality, it's secure, and it delights your customers. And that is what we talked about today. And so now I'm going to do what I do at the end of every talk. I'm going to give you resources. So first of all, totally awesome books. If you are into DevOps or DevSecOps, you want to read the DevOps Handbook. You want to read the Phoenix Project. You want to read Accelerate and the Unicorn Project, because I want to be Maxine when I grow up. And then you want to read Alison Bob Learn Application Security. Yes, I know it's my book. I couldn't help it. I'm sorry. But I think it's really good. I worked really hard on it. Um, if you are a woman or a person who um, is not a man and you want to meet lots and lots of cool people that work in information security, you should consider joining WOSEC. Um, we are a community that's international and we want to make friends with you, essentially. Um, yeah, we want people to find careers in InfoSec, but we also want them to find peers and friends and colleagues and people they can trust and grow with. And um, we now have a web page, so it's like we're all grown up. Awesome. I also want you to check out Cyber Mentoring Monday. So every Monday, I use this hashtag, and there's a whole bunch of us now doing this. And every Monday we post, we try to pair people with professional mentors. And this has resulted in people finding new jobs, making new friends, changing careers, and it's really exciting. It costs nothing. You just need to make a Twitter account. And every Monday we use this hashtag. So if you could, if you know a lot, please consider answering someone's call because you will literally make their whole year. And you might find a really new, fantastic, amazing friend. And then resources me. I do all the things. I do the talks. I do the blogs. I make the videos. I tweet the tweets. I am a giant nerd at large on the internet. And I am all about securing software. And uh, it would be my pleasure to get to know all of you better. So um, with that, I would like to thank you so much for your time and attention today to learn about how DevSecOps is way more than just pipelines. Thank you.